Hey everyone, I'm Jared. Uh, sorry I couldn't be there to join you guys tonight. I go to Radford University and uh, had to record my project as a video and send it in to you guys. I hope you enjoy it. Um, I'm going to be presenting on the Long Valley Caldera and the Bishop Tuck, which we should be visiting the day we arrive and the day following to study the top. So, all that being said, let's start. Long Valley Caldera is located on California's eastern edge, so it's sort of sandwiched between the Nevada border on the eastern side and the Sierra Nevada on its western side. Now, if we zoom in a little more, we can see that the caldera has a roughly oval shape, with the one end of it pointing sort of northwest and the lower end of the oval pointing southeast, with Lake Crowley being at its southeastern edge. And Mammoth Mountain, you can see it over here if you look closely, is sort of a, a large white dot next to Mammoth Lakes is on its far western side. I've got the LVC symbol directly over the resurgent dome, which I will discuss in a moment. Uh, the Inyomono mountain chain runs directly past it, and actually uh, one of the mountains on the rim of the caldera itself, Mammoth Mountain, is a part of this mountain chain. Um, I'll discuss that as well. Okay, so if we look at the caldera from this vantage point, we really get a more of a sense that this is a giant hole that's been blown out of the earth, just like Yellowstone, only as you'll see in a moment, this is a lot different from Yellowstone. Right now, you are looking at the caldera over the northwestern rim, specifically over Mammoth Mountain, which is a actually an active volcano, which is the tallest point on the rim. And at this point, the tallest point, the rim walls reach about 3,500 meters, about uh, 1,500-1,600 1, feet. And then if you look out over the caldera, over Mammoth Lakes, you can see down in the northeastern side of the photo here, there's a lake. And down there, the walls are at its shortest. They're only about 150 meters or 500 feet tall. Um, the actual full size of the caldera that you're looking at is about 576 square kilometers. That's 32 kilometers east to west and about 18 kilometers north to south. The caldera itself is actually about 2,000 meters on the eastern end and 2,600 meters on the western end. Now, when people think of calderas, one of the first things their minds jump to is Yellowstone. Well, Yellowstone was caused by a hot spot. Is Long Valley Caldera like Yellowstone in that it was over a hot spot? No. Well, what about the Sierra Nevada mountain chain? That's got quite a number of volcanoes on it, and those are caused by subduction. Well, it's not caused by subduction either. Unfortunately, the actual cause of the gathering of magma under this area is not precisely known yet. What we do know is that about 2.5 to 4 million years ago, magma began to gather under the spot we now know as Long Valley Caldera. At around 3.8 million years ago, some of this magma starts to vent up to the surface and starts covering the landscape in salts and andesites. Thus, that's why I have this lovely picture of Hawaii. However, the magma erupting from these vents did not stay basaltic. It, over time, became increasingly silic until about 2.1 to 0.8 million years ago, we had an entirely rhyolitic eruption creating Glass Mountain. So this transition from low silic to the viscous rhyolites that composed Glass Mountain indicate that magma was evolving on a chemical scale and creating some sort of gassy silic brew that just so happened to be brewing in a shallow chamber just four miles underground. Now this buildup of pressure that's coming from these gases couldn't quite be relieved by the current magma chambers leading to the volcanoes. Well, you got that much gas and it's building up over that much time until eventually, well, oh dear. Finally, 760,000 years ago, the pressure building underground was just too much. What ensued looked something like this, only a lot worse. 
600 cubic kilometers of rock are blown from the earth, half of it soaring as high as 40 kilometers into the sky. The rest smothered the landscape in a series of terrifying pyroclastic flows that split 300 cubic kilometers of superheated earth. After this hole is blown, a good portion of this pyroclastic debris falls back into the hole, filling it about two-thirds deep, or two to three kilometers. But what's really impressive was the ash cloud. The eruption throws ash as high as Wyoming and as far as Kansas, creating a volcanic tableland of ash around the eruption site. The ash fall that results from the eruption is known as the Bishop Tuff. Now, the Bishop Tuff is divided into sequences according to the time it fell and the event that created the layer. As you can see in these photos, the ash is bedded differently and in some spots even appears different colors. The pyroclastic flows would deposit large debris and boulder and gravel size tuff, whereas the ash fall created finer layers that underlay and overlay the denser grain portions of the ash. Now, the pink in the ash is due to increased oxidation from the heat of the debris. Here's a nifty graphic I found showing the stratigraphic sequence of the ash fall with the appropriate time sequence of blue. However, I like this graphic a little bit more. Here you are viewing the caldera in a cross section. The blue basement layer are the magmas deposited by the early basaltic and intermediate eruptions leading to the caldera eruption. In pink is the Bishop Tuff. On top of it, <clears throat> the layer on top is from the flows of obsidian, an occasional eruption of tephra as a caldera continue to let off steam after the primary eruption. The caldera as it is seen today, mostly extinct. A few volcanic events that followed the eruption emptied the chamber of its remaining pressure, and thanks to seismic mapping, we now know that the chamber is mostly crystallized. However, these events and the remaining heat has caused an upswelling in the floor of the valley known as a resurgent dome. This magmatic uplift in itself is still volcanically active and causes geothermal events on the surface. The waters from the Owens River get superheated and lead to hot springs and creeks. The geothermal activity has actually altered some of the surface rocks, turning them into travertine and clay. These spots not only offer an exciting natural hot tub for tourists, but also provide power to a geothermal plant in the Long Valley Caldera Base. So that's mostly it. Uh, the Long Valley Caldera was this ginormous supervolcano eruption. Supervolcano. Uh, that threw a, a tremendous amount of ash into the air, uh, blanketing 100 square miles with ash. So, uh, before I go, I want to share a few interesting random facts about the Long Valley Caldera and the Bishop Mammoth Mountain. As I said, it is the tallest point of the Caldera Rim. It's 3,370 meters above sea level, towering 502 meters above the caldera floor. It is a member of the Mano Inyo volcanic chain, which has had 20 eruptions in the last 5,000 years alone. It's also the site of a very successful ski resort. The Owens River passes through the entire caldera, starting up at the northwest end and passing through the southeast end after gathering behind a man-made dam at Crowley Lake. The river not only fuels the neat geothermal features, but it carves into the layers of tuff, giving us amazing views of the layers. The tuff, in itself by the way, is the oldest tuff in the world that is oriented to current magnetic norms. Blast Mountain Some say it is the only mountain to, to have survived the blast. I say it wasn't technically in the blast zone. The mountain is made of increasingly silic and rhyolitic layers in the form of obsidian. My favorite rock. That's cool. Well, that's it for me. Uh, I hope you enjoyed my presentation as much as I enjoyed researching it and giving it to you. If you guys have any questions or comments, I'm sure Callan will oblige by uh, giving you my email, and then I give you official permission to blow up my mailbox. Other than that, I'll see you all on Saturday.